I wonder <coughs> what you would like to talk about. Just a minute, sir. Just a minute. <laughs> I've just begun, sir. I'd like to know, if I may, if one may, what you would like to talk about. There are lots of questions, many questions which can't possibly be answered. Only some can be answered, and here they are typed out, which I have not seen. But before we begin to ask these questions, I wonder what you would like to talk about. Not all of you at once, because that would be impossible. To talk yes, about which suggest to me. To talk about the conditions that the people grasp what you are saying. I'm not certain I have it either. I couldn't hear that, sir. To talk about, to make this co the condition about the condition that all people grasp what you are talking about. Because you know this so often, Krishnamurti. Do you understand? I doubt it, but I have to go on. See, and there is, there is something missing. See, that the, that the brain cannot catch on. I don't quite understand the question. What, what conditions are necessary in order to understand what you're talking about? What conditions are necessary? What K is talking about? Is that it? In order to understand what you're talking about. In order to grasp what you're saying. In order to? In order to grasp what you're saying. Oh, they said, in order to grasp what you're talking about, what is necessary. Is that what you want to talk about? You are one, sir. Don't all. What is it you would all like to talk about? What shall we teach our children? Big what? What shall we teach our children? What shall we teach our children? Please talk more on what you said on Tuesday. Freedom means love. You could talk a great deal about that. What you talked about on Tuesday, about love, could you go into that, right? Yes, freedom, you said, yeah. means love. Just at the now look, there's so many of us. The first question was, what is necessary? What kind of brain is ne one must have? <coughs> to understand what you're talking about, to grasp. It's not what the speaker is talking about, but to grasp your own understanding of yourself. Scrap the... or put aside what Kay is talking about, and let us see what is necessary to understand to go into oneself. Is that it? Would you like to talk about that? Yes. Apart from the questions. What is, what are the barriers that prevent us from understanding our own selves, not only at the conscious level, at the level of daily activities, but also go much deeper into oneself. Is that what you all want to talk about? If one asks that question of oneself, what prevents me or you from understanding? 
delving <coughs> into oneself very, very deeply. What is the thing that's lacking? Isn't that? What do you think? Don't all say at once. What, what does each one of us say, answer, or respond when we put that question to ourselves? What is it? I'm occupied all day with business, traveling here and there. If I'm an artist, I'm concerned with painting, writing poems, literature. And if I'm a politician, I'm greatly concerned about politics, my place in it, and my self-interest, my ambition, and then the concern by, about people afterwards. So, what is it that is lacking? Energy? Intelli intellectual capacity? We're just going to investigate it together. Intellectual capacity? Or we are too emotional? Or we are we have got so many romantic illusory concepts, images about others and about ourselves that prevents us from grasping the whole of my being, of one's being. Is it <clears throat> I'm too occupied with my children, my wife, my job, my amusement, my place in society and so on. This perpetual occupation, constant chattering of one's own, of one's own problems and one's own uh, against or for the environment, or fundamentalists. I don't know if you have noticed this fact that fundamentalism is spreading extraordinarily in this country. And also it is spreading in Iran and Iraq, Baghdad, not Baghdad, Lebanon, and also it's gradually seeping into India. This is taking all this is taking a great deal of our time. And therefore, is it that we haven't the energy or the urge at the end of the day or the beginning of the day that we are not sufficiently recollected, deeply concerned? We are concerned about money, sex, position, and so on, and so on. That is, we are occupied a great. We occupy ourselves great deal with superficial things. Does that deprive us of energy to dig deeply? I'm just asking this question. Or, I'm really not interested in all this. I like to catch a little bit here and there, go to various gurus and various tricksters, theoreticians and theologians, and the experts in religion, and catch a little bit of all this, and they make a good table conversation. Is this what is what we are occupied with most of the day? Or do you set aside and we are not advocating anything, we are just talking about it. Or you set aside 
sometime in the morning or afternoon and the evening and little bit attempt to be serious. Or we take each part of life as a segment, part, and deal with those parts. Or I can go on. Or can you look at this whole structure of ourselves as a whole, not as fragmented beings? Is that possible? That is, you are not, if I may, if I may point out, you are not understanding K. You are understanding or using K as a mirror to understand yourself. And the mirror is not important. That's the first thing to realize. The mirror, the person is not important. What he is saying may reflect what you are. May. It may be contrary, but you are beginning to look at yourself, doubting, questioning, asking. So, how do you approach this question? Because the approach matters much more than the fact. Are, you to, are we together in this? The approach, whether it be a scientific problem or an artistic problem or a humanitarian problem or a social problem, political and so on, or religious, how do you approach it, come near it? Because how you Come to it is great importance, not the, what the question is or the problem is. Because if I approach it with a preconceived ideological image, that image in, intervenes between my, the approach and the thing to be approached. Are we in this together? A little bit? So that can one approach a, an issue, a challenge, a problem, <coughs> however trivial, however deep, without all the connivance without all the previous conclusions, prejudices, and come to it afresh. Can we do that? Or is that impossible? Because one has been trained and educated from childhood to be a Catholic, Protestant, Hindu, Buddhist, and all the rest of it. And one revolts against all that, if one is at all intelligent and active, say what nonsense all that is. But that makes one's life very shallow also. So then you try to f fill that shallowness with all kinds of amusement, drugs and entertainment, sex and all the rest of it. So how does one approach the question? Please ask this question of yourself. If you are a businessman, you approach it very cautiously, seeing what the reward is, what the not the reward, punishment and reward. If the reward is great, you go on. If it is not great, you slightly hesitate, you talk about it and gradually learn avoiding something which is not profitable. In the same way, 
We look at life from the point of reward and punishment. Right? If I do this, I can reach heaven, or nirvana, or whatever, enlightenment, and so on. So there is always this background of gaining and losing. Right? Can one put aside all that and look at the problem? Approach the problem freely. Talk just now, I asked you a question just now. Would you go into the question of what you talked on Tuesday? It's about love and all the complex complexity of it. Right? Why do you want me to talk about it? Why is it we can't ourselves go into it very cautiously, not assume anything, be terribly honest, and see what it all means. Is that impossible? See, unfortunately, one of our difficulties is we read so much, we have been told so much by philosophers, by experts, by specialists, by those who have travelled all over the world and gathered information, met various saints and crooks and gurus and a whole lot of them. And they say, yes, I met all these people, I know. And we, we are so gullible and so eager we take on the, their colouring. Do we do this? All the newspapers, magazines, that's what they're doing to us. Every evening commercials. You follow? Look at all this. And we're being bombarded by all this. So that gradually our brains narrow down because this, of this bombardment. It's like constantly being shocked. So would you consider <coughs> whether it is possible to put aside all this and look at it all anew, afresh, as though you were seeing things for the first time. Could we do this? Or it's only given to the few, which I don't which is nonsense. Though people pretend yes. I can do it, but I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> that's sheer, that's, I wouldn't accept such a thing. Why is our brain become so petty? You understand? The word petty. Narrow, limited, deeply rooted in self interest. So, these are questions that can be put, but the answer or the discovery or the root of all this, one has to dig oneself and go into it. It's no good talking to each other all day long, or even for an hour. It's good to listen to each other. And how you listen also matters tremendously. 
whether you actually listen in the sense that you are listening without any determination, without any direction, bringing your own reaction, just to listen. As a child listens to an excellent, exciting story, he's full of eagerness, curiosity to find out. Could we do that? Not only listen to the birds and, and so on, but also listen to all our thoughts, all our feelings and images, watch the images that we are building constantly. Can we go back to the questions? As we said, there are several questions here, eight of them. Can we listen to the question first, without any reaction? Without saying, yes, I, I understand all. Just capture the question. It's like planting a seed in the ground in a healthy, well enrich soil, planting a seed. If the seed has vitality, energy, the intrinsic value of its, uh, of its own, then you don't have to do anything. You water it occasionally, look after it, and it will grow. So the question is the seed. I wonder if you're And let the question move. Let the question develop, enlarge, and see if there is, whether there is anything in the question at all, or just a weed. Some weeds are nice looking and worthwhile. But some weeds are utterly useless, destructive. So we're going to find out. Sorry to make all these remarks. We're going to find out the worth of the question, the question may be put superficially or with great intent. And the question is not put by somebody else, but the question is being put to, to each one of us. What is the difference between that shyness you have talked about and fear? What is the difference between that shyness in quotes you have talked about and fear. I don't know when I've talked. Sorry. Maybe they mean humility. What's that? Maybe, maybe they mean humility. Timid, timid, timid. Humility. Humility. We talked about the other day fear. Fear is identified with the ego, with the me, with the whole structure of my psyche, it's part of my psyche, part of me. And fear also breeds guilt. 
various types of greed. And all this makes one rather nervous, one has temerity, shyness, a sense of withdrawing, and yet wanting to express oneself. So there is a, a contradiction in oneself, and that contradiction brings further guilt, and we carry on this way. Now, what is the root of this? You understand my question? The fear, guilt, and being rather timid, and not wanting to hurt others, but yet the very word you say might hurt others. If a, if a Hindu says, it's all what you are talking about, all your religious nonsense, you get hurt. And you hurt him. So this goes on. Is it possible to live daily life without fear first? That is important. Not all the branches of it. Guilt, <coughs> timidness, and the feeling of wanting to resist, wanting to hit back, all that is rooted in the sensation of fear. Would you agree to that? Would you see that? Do we see that? Not because I am describing. Not because the speaker is unfolding it. You see it if you watch it quietly, the activities of fear, how it creates barriers, not only in our relationship, but also in our attitudes to the whole of humanity, and so on. So we are asking, first, is it possible to live without fear? Not say, I must be courageous. That's, you can be courageous by taking some kind of drug. We know a friend who is producing rum. and is supplying rum to the army. And he said, well, it's a very profitable business because soldiers in front, going to the front are very, very nervous, and this gives them a certain sense of courage, and various other reasons. So, <coughs> if we could really delve deeply into this question, Together, not I explain, you accept. That's, that's no meaning. As we talked about it the other day, time and thought are the two major factors in the manufacturing, if I can use that word, fear. We went to the question of time. You want the do we, shall we go into it again? Yes? No. You're rather silent, so I'll, shall I? Yes. <laughs> yes. I'm not forcing yes. it. Yes. This is rather a complex question, and therefore must be approached very simply. We have all of us live within the <coughs> radius or within the diameter, within the, within the time process. All of us live in the time process. 
that is, I have done something, I will do that again today, change it, modify it, and I will do it again tomorrow, but modify it. And if you watch yourself very carefully, all the memories are the result of experience knowledge contained within the brain. Perhaps not whole of the brain, major part of the brain. Please, I'm not. The speaker is not an expert in, in brain neurology or all the rest of it. He just watched it, watched, and it, by watching it tells you you learn a lot. Not only from books. I, the speaker doesn't talk, read books, fortunately. He reads other kind of thrillers and so on. Don't bother. <laughs> so, time, which is evolution in one sense, time as survival, time as something to be gained, something to be achieved. An ideal to be pursued, or a theology, a conclusion, an ideology to be held strongly and see that ideology is carried out. And the same thing applies to the theologians. They have certain theories about God and work that out. All this takes time, right? And also, it take, t- time is necessary to say, I am this today, I was this yesterday also, but I need time to change it. The word change implies time. I don't know if you are following all right? Are you interested in all this? All right, I'll talk for the talking's sake. So, not for talking, say I'm interested in myself tremendously. In this cycle of time we are caught. Whether it's the greatest scientist or the greatest religious person, so-called religious, or the ordinary layman like us. We are caught in this. Right? There is not only time according to sunrise and sunset, and the time by the watch. You need time to go to your rendezvous. You need time to learn a language, a skill, and so on, to acquire more knowledge. All this requires time. (coughs) And man has asked, is there an end to time? He's asked this. You will find it in various literature, Shakespeare, I have been told, time must have a stop. And also, Eastern philosophers, Eastern saints, and Eastern people who have thought about it, they have inquired into it. And they have invented various forms of ending the time, various methods. That is, your interest in all this? That is, is there an ending to knowledge which is time? I wonder if you capture this. I need time to acquire knowledge. Right? I don't know how to fly, but I will learn. I don't know how to be a good master carpenter, but I learn about it, work at it. Which is acquiring knowledge about a skill flying, science, whatever it is. And 
they asked, is there an end to knowledge? Or must it always go on and on and on and on, the boredom of it? You understand? So we are, you are asking that question. That is, is time by which we live, we do, act, think, feel, And when one watches it, one gets rather tired of it all, bored. And also in acquiring this skill, one becomes lonely. And out of the loneliness, you act, you do various kinds of activities, and you become neurotic and psychopath, all the rest of it. So this goes on. So one asks very carefully, what is the past? Which is time. Hum humanity has lived on this earth, according to the archaeologists, scientists and so on, for over two to three million years, or recently, 50,000 years, right? We have evolved. And during that long period of time, our brain has gathered infinite information and has battled with each other, killed each other, right? Gone through various horrors, Barbarism, cruelty, extraordinary brutality, holocausts, not only in the recent holocaust in Germany, but there was Attila, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, Caesar, and that butchering of man is going on now. So, at the end of this long period, what are we now? Do you understand my question? What are you? What? Are we still barbarians, savages, highly cultured savages, sophisticated savages, fighting each other, aggressive, brutal, killing? So that's what's going on. Have you ever noticed not one – I mustn't be too emphatic about this – not one priest, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, not any of them have said, stop wars. Don't kill anymore. Right? Not one of them. If they insisted on it, the church would collapse. But people love to kill each other. No? Yes, sir. They are born to hurt each other. They are cruel to each other. So all this has come about, with, and it is still with us, during the long period of evolution, which is time. Right? I wonder if you're capturing all this. And so one asks, is there an end to all this? Which is ending of time. And time is also psychologically becoming something, which is far more important which means I have certain ideals, certain concept theories, uh, visions, and I want it will take time to achieve it, which is I will become that, which is again reward and punishment, the same thing, different words. So it is all that which is involves time can it end. 
So if you ask, if you put your guts into this, sorry to use that word, put your whole heart to find out. That is, I have been for centuries this in the past, and those centuries are now, right? Centuries, all those experiences, all that is now is in me, in you. And tomorrow, is modified by recent challenges, economic, social, war, and so on. The, the past is modified and goes on into the future. Right? This is a fact. So one says, the future is now. I wonder if you see this. Right, sirs? Do see this really, not verbally, see the f truth of it. The future is now, because if I have been that for centuries, millions of years, and if I don't fundamentally bring about a mutation now, I'll be the same, modified tomorrow. So tomorrow is now. I wonder if you see this. So what then is the position of a brain, or the state of the brain, that doesn't look to tomorrow, I will change, I will become that. If you brush up, because all that is now, if you don't, if there is no total psychological revolution. The communists are frightened of revolution, because they are stuck in their ideology and they won't change. And they will go on that way, till there is another physical revolution. So we are doing exactly the same thing in a milder form. So the past, modifying itself to, through today, continues as tomorrow. This is a fact. So tomorrow is now. And if there is no deep revolution in the psyche, tomorrow will be the same. So is it possible to radically end? I wonder if you are. I have been greedy, violent, acquisitive, possessive, that's enough. Hmm? <laughs> and can all that end now? Instant. So ask this question. Either you treat the whole thing as an idea or a fact. That is, you hear this and translate what you hear into idea a concept, a utopia, something to be achieved, then you are back in the whole cycle. But can you look at the fact and remain with the fact? That is, I don't want to. So how do you observe a fact? Observe. Not analyze. How do you observe a fact? There is the there is the oak tree there. How do you look at it? Do please look at that oak tree and find out how you 
observe it, not only visually, optically, and the nervous responses, all that, but what is the process of observation? Are you interested in all? Yes. No, don't be eager, sir. Don't say yes too quickly. Yes. <laughs> it's easy to observe impartially. Without any prejudice, the tree. Yes, she says an oak tree. Or the mountains and the rivers and the valleys and the meadows and the groves. That's very simple. But can you observe your wife, your friend, your antagonist without any direction, without any bias? To be aware without choice, right? Can you do it? It becomes extraordinarily interesting to find out if you can do it, right? I don't want to go into... We are still talking about the first question. Nearly quarter past four. <coughs> Sir, to put it very briefly, because we must go on, can you watch, as you watch in the mirror, your face when you're doing your hair, combing, shaving, and so on? Can you watch? yourself in a mirror so that psychologically you see everything in minute detail what you are. You understand my question? Is there a psychological mirror? As there is a physical mirror, a good mirror doesn't distort. Shows you exactly what you look like. If you are interested in what you look like. So, is there a mirror which doesn't distort a thing psychologically? You see the whole psyche, or part, as you move, as you look, you can observe the details of your face. The eyebrows, the eyes, the nose, the shape of the nose, the depth of the nose, the, the ear, and all that. If you are, you know, most people do this, especially the ladies. So you keep looking. We are asking, is there such a mirror inwardly, so that you see exactly Minute details, the latest wrinkles. <laughs> Can you see that we there is such a mirror? The mirror is your relationship. The relationship between you and another, between you and your wife, or your husband, your children, relationship. Either that relationship is very, very superficial, merely sensational or sexual, even there you begin to see very clearly what, if you see the mirror, or it's very intimate, very close, very observable, 
in that relationship, that relationship is the mirror. It will never distort. But if, but when there is in that relation sensation and possession, domination, merely sensation and so on, then the mirror is distorts. Right? So to observe very carefully the minutest activity in that mirror. And as you observe it, the mirror tells you the whole story. And then you can put aside the mirror, because the mirror is not important. Relationship then becomes extraordinarily important. Gosh! The whole world of nature is a competition to survive. Is it not innate in human humans to struggle for the same reason? And are we not struggling against our basic nature in seeking to change? The whole world of nature is a competition to survive. Is it not innate in human in humans to struggle for the same reason. Are we not struggling against our basic nature in seeking change? Don't change. It's very simple. If you want to remain as you are, carry on. Nobody is going to prevent you. Religions have tried to civilise man. But they haven't succeeded. On the contrary, some religions of Christianity have killed more people than anybody on earth. Right? I don't know if you have watched this. They have had two appalling wars. And they have killed millions. Not only Stalin and Mao Zedong. These wars have destroyed. Right? And if you carry on if we carry on this way, not wanting to change, it's all right. But the question is nature struggles to achieve light, right? In a forest, for example. And it's a struggle. Right? The big, the uh, stronger kills the weaker in nature. The tiger kills the deer, lion kills the some other thing. This goes on. This is part of nature. And the question says, if it is part of nature, why should we change at all? Because it's intrinsic. Why do we say it's intrinsic? Why do we say it's there it's all right and therefore it's all right with us too? And so let us why bother to change? It's part of us, part of nature, part of our existence, part intrinsically it is what we are. And if that is so that it is instinct, that is innate in us, which, I, which one questions very deeply, then I can't change anything. But why should we accept that it is innate in us? Is it my indolence, for God's sake, leave it all alone? Is it my sense of exhaustion? Or 
we are supposed to be as human beings little more intelligent little more reasonable little more sane and we are supposed to use our sanity our intelligence our experience to live different Right? To live differently. Perhaps the difference may be total, and not just remain mediocre as a mediocre person, which is now being encouraged to remain human beings to be remain mediocre through their education and all the rest. I won't go into it. So is it mediocrity? That is fighting us, that we hold on to, and so we are slowly moving. It's all right. Slowly moving towards the precipice. Or if you begin to question the whole process of our existence using common sense. Logic, reason, awareness, and one questions intuition that is rather doubtful, because it may be one's wish fulfilment, calling it in instinct or in intuition. But one has to use logic in all this, not just say, well, we need. Let's go to the next question. Why is it that mankind universally has sought what is called God? Is it only out of fear and a need for security? Or is there some essential religious instinct in all human beings? Why is it that mankind universally has sought what is called God? Is it only out of fear and need for security, or is there some essential religious instinct in all human beings? What do you think? What's your response to that question? Is it fear? Is the desire for security? Is it the desire to be ultimately rewarded? Is it desire for comfort? Is it we are so discontented? With everything about us, that we want something to reach, to gain. And the religions have said God has made man, put it in different words. Obviously, it must be an extraordinarily strange God. And has man made God? You understand? If God has made us, something has gone wrong. <laughs> no, no, please, sir, this is very serious. This is not just, it's laughable when you look at it and tragic. We have killed, oh, no, I won't go, you know all that. See, what is it that is making man, human beings, create something called that, that world? If you have not that world, you, you create something else. So the question is not whether it is God or not, but 
Why do human beings live with illusions? Illusions, images, symbols. Why? If you look at, if you delve in, if you look at yourself, you've got lots of images. Image about yourself first, then the image about your wife and your children, if you are a parent. Or you have images about the politicians, religious people, you follow. We accumulate images which are illusions. If I create an image about my wife, which we do, so am I coming too near? Too near the bone. If I cre- create an image about my wife, that image has been built through fifty years or ten days or one day. What takes place in our relationship? The image becomes far more important than the fact, right? So, I impose this image on my wife or husband, whatever it is, on the politician. And this image then becomes far greater potential than the wife, the actuality. Right, sir? You people are married, you know all the game of it. The quarrels, you follow? Which means this image intervenes all the time. So, this image or images separates us. She is fulfilling, fulfilling her ambition, her position in society. The tremendous women's activity and the men's activity. So these images and the pursuit of their the fulfilment of those images are separating us, the man and the woman. This is an all common sense. And the brain then says, why should I create these images? What what is the raison d'etre for this? None at all, if you go into it. The wife is what she is, and I, the man, am what I am. And from there you start, you can do something. You can break the image and say, all right, let's face things as they are. You are possessive, and I don't want to be possessive. Right? You like being possessed, man or woman, and I said, you don't, don't cling to me, for God's sake. And so we begin to quarrel. Because I have an image of myself. You follow? He says, I don't want to be clung, clung to. Not by her, but by somebody else. So goes on. So can we live? That's the real question there, not live in God or not. The real question is in this is can one live without a single illusion? That's real freedom, you understand? That means you're facing facts all the time. Not try to change the facts. That takes place when you just watch the fact.
what is the primary basic obstacle which prevents observation and insight? What is the primary basic obstacle which prevents observation and insight? We've talked about observation just now, so we won't go into it again, because it becomes tiresome. What is insight? People have talked about it, to have an insight in things. That is, having a perception into not only images, illusions, but in facts. How do you have an insight in things? How do you have an insight? Let's take for example, I'm taking that as an example, that all religious organization is merely the activity of convenience, fear, right? All that, all religious organizations, whether it's Christianity or Hinduism, you understand? Insight, which means what? If I, am in, if I cling to Hinduism, I shan't have an insight into Hinduism, right? So I must be free of my conditioning to have insight. Insight implies not having the continuity of memory, which is the past and all the rest of it, but the ending of it seeing something new. If I have been programmed as a Catholic Hindu, whatever it is, democratic or republican or Presbyterian, God knows what else, if I have been conditioned, and that condition is always active, I cannot have an insight. I may have the capacity to invent. Naturally, invention is based on knowledge. Creation is not. Oh, I won't go into that totally different subject. Creation is continuous. It's not just creation and the end. We'll talk about some Saturday, Sunday, for a time. So, to have an insight into things, there must be freedom from memory. That's the conditioning. The brain that is programmed, as we are, cannot have insight. It may have slight partial insights, which the scientists have. It's partial. Because then the invention brings about other results, harmful, beneficial, and all the rest of it, and you follow all that takes place. But total insight is to be free of the conditioning of the brain, and the, that freedom, total freedom, gives you a complete holistic insight. What is the responsibility to ourselves to and others? What is responsibility to ourselves and to others? I don't quite do I don't quite understand the question. Let's look at the question. Responsibility, what do you mean responsibility? The word responsibility, which means pro respond, it comes from that word respond. 
respond means it's retrospective. Right? Look at it carefully. I don't know, I'm just we are just investigating the world. I have a responsibility towards my wife. That's what we say. We are looking at the word responsibility. I I respond to her in a certain way, which I don't respond to others in the same way. Right? I respond according to my background of what I have learnt about her. And she responds what she's learnt about me. If that response, which is retrospecting, that is, looking back, because she's my wife, I've learnt about her, and that learning is memory. So the, re- <coughs> the word responsibility implies memory, recognition, the recognition is part of memory, you follow? All that. So responsibility towards her and the responsibility in our relation sexually and so on, sensation produces the baby and we are resp- together we are responsible for the baby. We are responsible for its education. Superficial education, right? School, college, university, if we have the money, or halfway. And so, up to a certain age, we are responsible for her, for them. Afterwards, they can go. And in old age, they throw me out, send me to Florida or some place. <laughs> or old age homes, you know, what's happening in this country. The tragedy of it all, you don't see it. And in India, there is no social security. I was told yesterday, the most populated country in the world, India is. It's the size, one-third the size of America, of this country. And population is growing every year at the rate of 15 million a year. It's over 800 million people there. There, as there is no social security, they must have children, especially men, boys. Because when they grow old, as we all do, the sun will look after them. That's the idea of having three or four children, not just one child. You understand? Please understand the tragedy of all this. And as the boy grows older, gets a job, this has been one of their burdens to look after their parents, educate their brother, sister. You understand, sir? When they can't, I know several, I have known several boys and girls who have committed suicide because they can't manage it anymore. They feel so responsible for their parents. So the word responsibility is very complex. You understand? And are we responsible to ourselves? That's the question. What is the what is responsibility to ourselves and to others? Are we responsible to ourselves? What does that mean? Who is ourselves? You understand, sir? 
Who is ourselves? Who is we? Who is I? Am I responsible to myself? Which means, you understand the division? I wonder if you see that. There is a person who is responsible to myself. As I am responsible to my wife, there is somebody inside me or outside me who is responsible to me. Sounds rather silly, doesn't it? Or is there such a person who is responsible? God? Brezhnev? The glorified Father, in, you follow? Who is? You see how our brain works. When we say, "Am I responsible?" Is responsibility to myself, which means I have divided myself into some entity who is responsible to me. Therefore, I am responsible to that entity which I have separated carefully, which is myself. I don't know if you've gone that is. The thinker is the thought. Without thought there is no thinker. Right? But we have divided the thinker and the thought. I must control that thought. That's a bad thought, and I must think rightly, which means I am different from thought. So the thinker is the thought. There is no separation. The observer, psychologically, is the observed. There is no experience without the experiencer. I could go on, right? The experiencer is the experience. So, then, what is the responsi- What is m- responsibility to others? Right. What is my responsibility to you? And what is your responsibility to me? Here is a, an audience. What's your responsibility to me? And what am I responsible to you? So look at it. I'm just looking at it for the first time. And all this comes out because because I really want to go into this question of responsibility. I want to see, am I responsible to you? And you are responsible to me. And if I say I am not responsible to you, then I am isolating myself. Right? And if you say to me, you're not, we are not responsible to you, then you put me aside. I wonder if you see this. Responsibility implies division, basically. Right? You are, I am responsible to her, and she is responsible to me. I am responsible to you, and you are responsible to me. That means I have separated myself from my wife, and I have separated myself from you, and you have separated from me. And so we have quarrel. I don't understand you, and we don't understand you. We said the same thing, which is, I am the Arab, you are the Israeli. Or if you don't like the Israelis, I am the Israeli, you are the Arabs. 
I am the Muslim and you are the Hindu. If you don't like it, I am the Muslim and you are the Hindu. So we battle each other. It's my country, I'm going to protect it. It's your country, protect it. And we're going to war it for each other. It's your ideology, and I'm going to be responsible to that ideology, and you're going to be responsible to the other ideology. Right? This is what is happening in the world, calling it responsibility. Especially the elite. You understand? The elite call it, we are responsible for the people. Having reached that elitism, the high, and that's we are responsible. It's all such rot to me, to me personally. Because we are one human being. We are. You go through all kinds of travails. So does the other human being. Psychologically, they have shed tears in India, and you have shed, they have shed tears in Europe, and you have shed tears here. Right? Tears are common to all of us, like laughter. You have destroyed the whole the Red Indian culture here. Wipe them out. That's your Holocaust. Just face it. And this has been going on from the beginning of time. And responsibility implies duty. Duty, I must do this. Duty to my country. Duty to my ideal. So look at all this. So is it possible? To live without division. Is it possible to live with my wife, if I have a wife, without any sense of division between her and me? Not common ambition. You understand? It's common ambition, then it's again a division. If it is each one of us is fulfilling ourselves, again a division. I don't I wonder if you see all this. So is it possible to live without any nationality? The speaker has both a diplomatic and Indian passport. Government of India gave me that. I don't know why, but they gave it to me. And it's a bore having a certain form of paper crossing the countries. And that doesn't make me make one an Indian paper. Do you understand? So is it possible to live without a single nationality, without being identified with any country? Because it's our earth, not your earth and my earth. Is it possible to live without any identification, without any religion? Think it out, sirs. Don't just agree or disagree. Or identified with any group, any organization, any institution. Which doesn't mean you are withdrawing from the world, isolating yourself from the contrary. 
because then you are the entire humanity, not just the idea of it, but the feeling of it, the religious, the religious feeling of it, that you are the entire humanity. I am my brother's keeper. Not that means I am going to interfere with the poor chap, tell him what to do. So, sirs, this is the last question and answer meeting. There are several questions left here, I can't go through them now. If, I'm, if one may ask, what have you received from all this? I'm asking this most respectfully and humbly. It's not aggressively put this question. What does one, after listening to some facts and not ideas and theories and opinions and judgments, what was what has one? Captured, received, or not help, seen for oneself. Get up. <laughs>